and good afternoon to all of the alumni joining us on the West Coast. Um, my name is Ryan Nidek, and I have the pleasure of serving as the president of the Student Engineers Council, and I'm also a senior majoring in computer science here at Virginia Tech's College of Engineering. We're delighted to have you join us today for the program. Thank you to all of the students attending today in the Haymarket Theater, plus the over 200 alumni attending virtually via YouTube. This was our improv solution to get everything to work while we were doing it. Sorry about that. Um, live production, it's great. Um, yeah, thank you to everyone here virtually in person. We have alumni joining from all over the United States. We also have numerous questions that were submitted as part of the program registration from our in-person and virtual attendees. Um, we'll go ahead and start our Q&A session after Director Gaten's lecture with some of those questions. Um, you can also use the QR code that will later appear on screen or go to sec.vt.edu slash space, that's sec vt.edu slash space and submit questions as they come to your mind throughout the program. Um, for those of you in person, please silence your cell phones, unless if your Be Real goes off, in which case, please take it right away. Um, it's been a great week for the Student Engineers Council. It's National Engineers Week. We've been excited to bring the entire college together um, through some activities. Monday night, we had trivia at the Maroon Door. Last night, we had our first ever College of Engineering talent show at the Lyric Theater downtown. Congratulations to everyone who performed. Um, and with that, I'll conclude my remarks and introduce our E-Week chair, Chen Ming Fan. Chen's a junior in aerospace engineering, and he's been the driving force behind the execution of a lot of our events this week. Chen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ryan. Well, it has indeed been a great start to E-Week. We have been looking forward to this for months. Um, we appreciate you all participating in the, the fun week of activities. When me and my fellow student leaders were putting together the activities for Engineers Week, we wanted to provide students with a unique opportunity to hear from a leader in their own field, creating this Engineers Week Distinguished Lecture. I hope that you have been looking forward to tonight's program as much as I have. As an engineer, uh, sorry, as a aerospace engineering major, I was overjoyed with the opportunity to host our speaker at Virginia Tech, Robin Gaines with the International Space Station and NASA. Her career is inspiring and she had been highly engaged with so many of the things that I have learned in my own studies. It is now my honor to introduce you, Julie Ross, who serves as the Paul and Dorothy Torgerson Dean of Engineering at Virginia Tech. Dean Ross is a chemical engineer and is a fellow of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering. She is focused on scaling up experiential learning for us as students, working towards more students having immersive experiences. She has also been instrumental as a spokesperson in elevating Virginia Tech's footprint and expansion in Blacksburg, Roanoke, in the Washington DC metro area in support of the $1 billion Virginia Tech Innovation Campus. Last June, Dean Russ was named the 2022 Outstanding Woman Leader in Virginia Higher Education by the Virginia Network for Women in Higher Education. I'm truly grateful to have such a visionary leader at the helm of Virginia Tech Engineering. Dean Ross has truly moved the college forward and has done so with an emphasis on creating new opportunities for students. Let's have a round of applause for Dean Ross. Well, thank you so much for uh, the kind introduction. I really appreciate it. It's great to see you all here this evening. Um, I, I really do appreciate all of the work of the Student Engineers Council for the lineup events for students this year during eWeek. It, it's, it's great to see, and it's really great to see the leadership from our students really um, making all this happen. So thank you, thank you, and, and thanks for inviting me to be here this evening. It is really my great honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Robin Gatins. She's the director of the International Space Station and the Space Operations Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. She's also an agency senior expert for environmental control and life support and crew health and performance systems. 
As the ISS director, she leads strategy, policy, stakeholder engagement for the space station program at the agency level. In her 37 years at NASA, she's led the development and management of life support and habitation systems for human spaceflight missions. Director Gatins is a recipient of NASA's Outstanding Leadership and Exceptional Achievement Medals. She did earn her bachelor's degree at Georgia Tech, but it was in chemical engineering, so go chemical engineers. And I, I have seen in my own eyes, actually, um, her excitement for Virginia Tech and the Hokie spirit, and I know she's really excited to talk with you all today. So please join me in giving a warm Hokie engineer welcome to Robin Gaines. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Ross. I'm so excited to be here. And uh, yes, I went to Georgia Tech. Let's just get that out. But um, I am a Hokie by marriage. My my husband, Dennis Gatins, is a double E grad in uh, 1983, and uh, he would have loved to have been here uh, as well tonight, but he uh, unfortunately had a conflict with a conference uh, down in Florida. So I'm super excited to be here. I've been on campus a number of times uh, with him, and but this is my first sort of official visit. And you guys have just been so warm and so welcoming. And um, I've really enjoyed my time so far. It's been a blast to, uh, uh, to get to know uh, you guys a little bit better. So thank you for the honor of inviting me and being part of your, your engineering week here at Virginia Tech. Um, all right, so figure out how the tech works here. Can you guys see where is it? Yeah, where is it? Where's our screen? <laughs> yeah. All right, I'll add lib while the screen comes down. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm really thrilled to be here and talk about this wonderful program, the International Space Station, that I've had uh, the great honor and privilege of working on pretty much my entire career at NASA. I started straight out of school um, at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in 1985 as a chemical engineer. Um, here it comes. And started uh, working uh, in, on propulsion systems, but uh, quickly found uh, that wasn't uh, really the niche I was looking for, and so, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center had just gotten the job of uh, doing the life support systems for the brand new space station program. So I got to work on the, the life support systems and love that. It was a great fit as a chemical engineer because it's a lot of chemical processes and um, pretty much spent my entire career from that point on working on the space station. Never imagined that I would work almost my whole career on one program, but it's been really exciting to start in the early design phase of a program like the space station and then follow it all the way through to operations today. So the International Space Station, there it is. Um, you know, it, it is such an incredible platform um, and I'm gonna talk more about the th all the things it stands for and what we do on this incredible platform, but. Uh, continuous presence in low Earth orbit for the last uh, 22 years, uh, and just an engineering marvel. Um, and it's just been an incredible honor to work on it. So it is a laboratory. In fact, it is your laboratory. 50% um, of the resources on the International Space Station, from crew time to cargo that we ship up to space inside, all of those resources uh, fifty percent belongs to not to NASA. It belongs to everybody else. So it's a national lab, and um, I told a group earlier that I was talking to, if you have a project you want to submit to the national lab and fly on the space station, um, you get all of that for free. Uh, all you have to do is bring your science. So kinds of stuff we do, um, it is a laboratory. We have uh, working laboratory equipment on the space station. We do human research, uh, biotechnology. 
we burn things, combustion experiments, um, fluids and materials, a bunch of earth observation instruments uh, that help uh, look at the earth and understand our climate and technology demonstrations. And it's an educational platform as well. We have activities for students ranging from pre-K, story time and space, all the way through high schoolers building space hardware um, and, and uh, college students sending CubeSats to the space station. So a few facts and figures, it's about the size of a football field. Uh, you probably heard that before. Inside, it's about the space of a five bedroom house. And it's a very crowded five bedroom house, I'll say. Um, we've added a lot over the years and, um, and uh, it's quite full and quite busy. We have seven crew on board uh, normally. Uh, we have a, a little bit more when we overlap and we're changing out crew for a short period of time, but normally seven. So uh, a few more facts and figures, um, covers 90% of the world's population. So uh, due to its orbit, um, it orbits 16 times a day and we can look at most of the populated area of the earth, which makes it a great platform for this earth observation. Um, it took 42 flights to assemble it. Really the first decade was devoted primarily to assembly and trying to get all the capabilities um, on the platform. Over 250 launches to the space station to date, 260 different people from 20 different countries. Um, lots and lots of folks here uh, and in other countries have worked on this project. Uh, so we're about 260 miles above the Earth and traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. So we have a video, not the one you're going to see today, but we have another one called uh, Science at 17,500 miles per hour, which is pretty fun. Um, I already talked about this. But we've been having an unbroken streak of human presence for 22 years on the International Space Station, which is, is no small feat. This is our current crew. And we have uh, three Americans. We have a Japanese astronaut, and then we have three Russian cosmonauts on the space station today. And so launching on Sunday will be uh, two more Americans, another Russian cosmonaut, and for the first time ever, a, uh, a UAE astronaut that will be spending a whole six month stay on the International Space Station. So we're really excited about that. Um, it's what we call an increment is every time we rotate a crew, we call it an increment or an expedition. And so we're on number 68 and they stay usually about six months. So I'm wearing the, this pin uh, for expedition 68 and uh, after we launch the next crew and we, we swap out crews and we'll start expedition 69. And this is what it looks like from the outside. This changes because we have uh, vehicles coming and going. We have docking ports on the space station and we bring up crew vehicles and cargo vehicles, both the US and the Russians. And so at any given time, there are different vehicles attached to different ports, but this is what it looks like right now. The Crew-5 is the, the US crew vehicle, and uh, it, it's called a Dragon. It's built by SpaceX, and they're one of our commercial partners that provides transportation to the space station. And launching on early Monday morning will be Crew-6. And so once Crew-6 arrives, it'll dock uh, to a different port, and then crew about a week later, uh, the crew assigned to Crew-5 will depart. Uh, the Cygnus, is a cargo ship built by Northrop Grumman and it brings important science and other supplies to the space station and it stays attached um, until all it's, uh, they're done with all that uh, science and cargo and then it leaves. Um, and then the Soyuz spacecraft, that's the Russian crew vehicle and the progress there on the back end is a Russian cargo vehicle. And it also provides uh, propulsion for the space station. So what kinds of research do we do? Um, all kinds, and we're so busy. Uh, we do human research and technology demonstrations uh, that are enabling us uh, to learn 
um, how to counter the effects of weightlessness on the human body, how to prepare ourselves uh, and our systems to go beyond low Earth orbit where it's, it's harder. So it's easy enough to launch a spare part to the International Space Station. Uh, it's not gonna be possible to do that when we venture out to the moon and to Mars. Um, so we need to be ready for that. So it's a, we use the space station today as a test bed to get us ready. Uh, we're also doing tons of science, both NASA science and non-NASA science. We've got, for example, National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, um, doing research on space station through our national lab. Uh, we also have uh, commercial companies um, who are trying to build better or learn about how to build better products. For example, Procter & Gamble wants to figure out how to extend the life of shampoo on the shelf and, and learn about how col colloids behave. For example, that's a project that has flown on the space station. Um, we use it as a big uh, platform for inspiration and education. So I talked about student engagement, but there's also a public engagement aspect to space station that, you know, even, even as NASA does these humongous new Artemis moon uh, launches that, that are, uh, you know, super exciting for the general public. Um, the space station's there every day. So every day we have an opportunity to engage uh, with astronauts and inspire the public. And we do that uh, through social media and a number of avenues. And then ultimately it's for benefiting life here on earth. So that, that's the ultimate goal. Uh, just a picture of, uh, it's not just the, the laboratory inside, but also a laboratory outside. We have a number of sites on the outside of the space station and platforms that host scientific instruments. And so these are a number of sites on, on both uh, uh, the, the Japanese, we call it the back porch of the Japanese module. Um, there's a, a site on the uh, European Columbus module and, and different areas. And we have a number of climate instruments that look at forest height, um, uh, plant uh, health and heat, uh, CO2, um, and all of those uh, climate instruments are very important for, for uh, studying the earth. We're up to, this chart is a little dated. It says there in tiny print, 109 countries have participated in some way or another on the International Space Station. We're actually up to 111. Um, we recently added uh, Uganda and Zimbabwe uh, who launched uh, some CubeSats on the space station. So pretty cool. We're coloring, literally coloring in the world map of countries and areas that have participated in some way on the International Space Station. So here's some baby pictures of the space station. Um, it did take, and there's uh, way more assembly flights than I have on this slide, but it did take some assembly. So uh, starting out in 1998, when we had uh, just a, a Russian um, sort of service vehicle docked to our U.S. node, that was, that was our baby space station. And we couldn't have permanent crew back then because we didn't have the life support systems and all the support for them to stay. So we visited it with the shuttle. Uh, built it out, became permanently crewed in the year uh, 2000 with Expedition 1, and we added our laboratory module called Destiny. And then uh, another, um, we added our, our Harmony uh, node module later on. So you see it growing, uh, getting more solar panels, more of the truss structure. Um, the Columbus, the European laboratory called Columbus was added in 2008 as well as the Japanese um, laboratory module called Kibo. Uh, in 2010, we added another uh, node called Tranquility. And, um, and then finally assembly complete in 2011, just as we retired the, the space shuttle. So that was, we needed the space shuttle to bring up these big pieces and really do a lot of the assembly of the space station. So. Uh, we were able to retire the shuttle at that point, and our focus became to transition to commercial crew and cargo transportation vehicles. Um, we didn't intend for that to take us nine years between shuttle retirement and our first crew launch 
um, on a U.S. crew vehicle from U.S. soil, but it did take us that long. I found a Hokie, <laughs> Charlie Camarda, um, who was an astronaut uh, from Virginia Tech. And uh, here's a photo of him on the space station. He actually flew on the uh, shuttle mission. It was an assembly mission in 2005. And it was um, the first one after we returned to flight following the Columbia disaster, which we just um, had our Remembrance Day, annual Remembrance Day for at NASA. Oops. And this is my video, but before I play it, it's not going to auto start. I wanted to set it up. So one of the one of my jobs in Washington is, um, as my bio said, overall policy and strategy. Well, what does that mean? Um, one of the things that I've been focused on is planning for um, the future of the space station. And wh where are we going from here? And then the transition from the International Space Station to future commercial space stations, which is in low, low Earth orbit, which is what NASA is trying to do. Um, so one of the things I'm proud of is I had to put together um, uh, a, a presentation and a story and brief it to the White House on hey, we really need to, in order for this transition plan to work so that we don't have a gap like we did for space shuttle, we don't want a gap in our capability in low Earth orbit. So we need more time on the International Space Station. Uh, we were only authorized till 2024 at the time. We need more time to extend operations on the space station while these follow on commercial space stations become ready. Um, and so I put together that story, um, went to, uh, to brief it, and on December 31st, a year ago, uh, the administration uh, announced that they, they would support uh, extension of the space station to 2030. So this is a video we put together. Um, it kind of highlights that and all the important work we do. So let me see if I can get it to play now. There we go. The International Space Station, an unparalleled laboratory for cutting edge research unachievable in Earth's gravity for the benefit of all humanity. An observatory for Earth's evolving climate. A beacon of international collaboration. And our home until 2030. As the station enters its third decade, it is busier than ever, developing technology for human exploration missions to the moon and Mars, finding new ways to combat disease, and acting as a test bed for in-space manufacturing of advanced materials and new medical products. Humanity's future is an ever-expanding team of nations and companies enabling exploration together and for the benefit of all. The International Space Station is a critical step on a great journey ahead to the moon and beyond. So we, we had the logo before I had the commitment. <laughs> But uh, we were very hopeful. Um, so now we're now we're going to be operating through 2030, which is awesome. And it's it is busier than ever, literally. So we're not just hanging on until these commercial space stations are ready in the latter part of the decade. We've got a lot of things we're trying to do on the space station while we have it. So um, I named this the decade of results, and it kind of stuck. Um, so we've got a lot of goals and we kind of put them together in this wheel to explain it to, um, to our stakeholders, um, in the general public, uh, to Congress, um, and the administration. So number one, we're using the space station to enable deep space exploration. I talked about using it as a test bed, uh, the life support systems that I started working on, 
Um, we're very much using space station as a test bed to learn about how to make them uh, uh, recover more water, more oxygen from CO2, as well as be more reliable. Uh, we're doing human research um, also to, under, to ensure that the crew are able to um, be healthy and survive a round trip to Mars, for example. Um, we're conducting all kinds of research to benefit humanity. Um, it's almost impossible to write concrete goals in this area because I would love to say we're going to cure cancer on the International Space Station, and we're definitely doing cancer research, but it's kind of hard to predict um, what's going to come out of all of the research that we're, we're doing on the space station. But there's life-saving medical research going on, um, understanding climate change, and more importantly, all of our science that we do is open to everybody. So we publish and make available all of this data um, for everybody. Um, enabling international collaboration. So we have our five space agencies that have partnered together on this platform. Uh, but beyond that, we're expanding. You know, we're about to launch uh, on Monday morning, we're about to launch our first uh, astronaut from the UAE. So we're expanding uh, who can participate as well in both uh, flying to the space station as well as doing research. Um, we're fostering this commercial space industry. We, uh, we have 24 facilities, laboratory facilities on the International Space Station today that were built by commercial companies, owned by commercial companies, and they're bringing users and customers in to use those facilities. So uh, we're enabling this market that will be customers of these future commercial space stations. We're flying private astronaut missions to the space station. Um, and and trying to really figure out what are the kinds of in-space manufacturing and other kinds of activities that, um, that will be these customers of the future. Um, I talked about the inspiration piece, so we're trying to broaden the reach of, of space and make, make it more accessible and create that diverse uh, future STEM workforce. And then finally, it's, a, it's an infrastructure. It is very between the the space station and the transportation vehicles that come and go it's a whole infrastructure in low earth orbit that has allowed this continuous human presence um, and our goal is to have no gap in that continuous human presence so switching gears a little bit because uh how many of you watched the artemis one launch and followed that mission yes yeah, super exciting um, so NASA's, NASA's doing Artemis, we are going, um, and we did our first, um, Artemis one, uh, mission. It, it was a great success. We're still looking at all of that data, but it's just the first mission of a long program, uh, that's going to uh, take us beyond low earth orbit back to the moon. And so these are all the components of the system, the big rocket, the space launch system, the Orion spacecraft. Uh, so what we did in Artemis One was a, was a flyby and the Orion spacecraft uh, didn't have any humans on it, um, but we'll eventually launch humans on it. So we have the human landing system that's gonna land on the moon. Uh, we're gonna be doing surface operations on the moon. Uh, we have a gateway plan, sort of a mini space station uh, around the moon that will be the destination for the Orion capsule to go and then the crew go down to the lunar surface uh, in the human landing system. We have a whole infrastructure of ground system support, communications. We have a rover planned uh, to be able to explore the moon. Uh, new spacesuits that we're gonna be testing on the space station and then be flying to the gateway um, and then eventually a whole base camp on the surface of the moon. So really exciting program. And we're just now at the beginning of it uh, with the Artemis one. And uh, we named it Artemis because it's the first, going to be the first woman and first person of color that we're gonna be sending to the lunar surface. And Artemis was the sister of Apollo. So this was the Artemis One mission. Uh, probably followed it where we uh, we launched, 
um, and, uh, and followed this mission for about two weeks as it orbited the moon and uh, took some incredible uh, images and then returned to Earth and splashed down. And I wish, uh, I really tried, I, I was hoping we would have a, a montage video of the whole mission for me to show you today, but our folks are still working on that. So I just pulled some pictures. Um, I know there's a lot out there, but this is an incredible picture of the launch itself. And then just some of the images along the way uh, that the uh, Orion was taking of the moon on approach. There's the earth um, and the close-up of the moon and then uh, finally splashing down. So really, really exciting. And we can't wait to do it all over again uh, in Artemis too, where we'll have a crew on board and we'll be doing another uh, trip around the moon. And then Artemis three will be when we're landing. And what we learn on the moon is going to really be important to, to uh, take us to Mars. And that's our ultimate goal is Mars and the solar system. So we're using uh, the moon as a proving ground uh, to learn about these uh, technologies and uh, how to do that mission. And then everything we learn there, we're going to uh, do our Mars mission. So stay tuned. So I'm gonna switch gears again and talk a little bit about my personal journey and my career. So I did go to, to Georgia Tech and um, there's some funny hair pictures in here. Apparently mullets were in, in 1985. Um, and I was in the Georgia Tech Chorale, so that's me singing. Uh, we were about the only ones that knew the alma mater in the whole school. Um, I chose chemical engineering, and the reason I chose chemical engineering was because um, really my dad um, actually suggested engineering. Um, I liked chemistry, and I liked um, problem solving, and so my dad said, hey, chemical engineering might be for you, and so that's, that's what I went for. Um, I don't know how familiar are with, if you're a student at Georgia Tech you get to and you're a freshman, you get to wear this dumb little hat, they call it a rat hat, and you're expected to wear it to football games. And the tradition is that you're supposed to write all the, the scores of all the football games your freshman year on this hat. Well, I did not want to write down any scores unless we won. So in, uh, in 1981, there's only one score on this hat. <laughs> it's not too different than today, honestly. Um, but funny thing is that, that the score written on this hat, and I know you can't see it, it says, I think it says uh, Georgia Tech 24, Alabama 21. So that, that was something. Uh, shoot, this is animated. Okay, from there, um, Really, my journey took me to NASA, and I wasn't like always, you know, I didn't grow up dreaming of working for NASA or wanting to be an astronaut. I know a lot of uh, people work for NASA that 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 was their dream and that was their plan. Um, I got my degree in chemical engineering, and had I not um, met my first husband who had co-opted with NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, uh, while at Georgia Tech, I probably would have ended up in Houston working for an oil company. That's who was hiring chemical engineers at the time. But uh, but I was engaged to be married, and uh, I was headed to Huntsville. And uh, there aren't a lot of chemical plants in Huntsville, Alabama. So fortunately, I was able to be uh, hired by NASA as well. And um, and initially was hired in to work on the space shuttle propulsion and uh, did that, but it was um, 1985. I was hired in uh, August of 1985 and what happened in January of 1986, the Challenger. So um, the Challenger uh, disaster happened in January of 1986. I was pretty new and all the senior leaders um, went off on tiger teams 
And honestly, I was kind of left, you know, without a whole lot to do. So <clears throat> I looked around and I found um, the group at Marshall Space Flight Center that had just gotten a job to do the space station life support systems. And that seemed like a really good fit for me. So I was, I transferred to that group and I started working on <laughs> the picture at the top right there is a carbon, carbon dioxide reduction system that I got to work on. It took CO2 and broke it down into solid carbon. And uh, man, that thing was a mess. Uh, but I had a lot of fun working on it in the laboratory and uh, working on all of the life support systems. Uh, very much a male-dominated um, culture back then. Uh, there's some photos of me uh, working with international partners um, where I was really the only female. And there's my, my Dorothy Hamill era as well. So trips to Japan to work with the Japanese on the Japanese experiment module, trips to Italy to work with the Italians uh, who built um, our, uh, a couple of our node modules on space station. And uh, that's me. And then uh, there's our test facility. So I did that for a number of years and worked my way up through different levels of responsibility. I was a subsystem um, lead and then a system engineering lead, um, all space station. Um, NASA stood up a program called Constellation and Constellation was NASA's program to go back to the moon. And I was asked to be uh, the life support lead for Constellation. So I did that for a little while. And then like a lot of programs at NASA, a uh, new administration came in and took a look and said, this is not what we want to do and canceled it. Uh, the piece of Constellation that survived was the Orion vehicle. So I ended up uh, being the crew and thermal uh, systems lead for the Orion project. And that's that middle picture, um, which was a little bit of a weird arrangement because I was in Huntsville at Marshall Space Flight Center. My entire team was uh, down in Houston at the Johnson Space Center. And this was pre-virtual anything pretty much, but so I, I, I worked uh, um, pretty remotely with my team, a lot of phone calls, a lot of trips, um, but I did that for about six years. And then headquarters called and said they were looking at some strategic planning and doing some road mapping and wanted somebody to lay out a future roadmap for uh, how to evolve these life support systems to support future missions. And it wasn't my day job. I didn't have to say yes, um, but I said, yes, all right, I'll do that. Um, so on top of my um, day responsibilities on the Orion project, I did this extra assignment for headquarters. And that led to headquarters offering me an opportunity to come up and um, which evolved into a, a permanent stay. So lesson learned, you just never know um, what, where your path might take you and something that's not even your day job assignment could uh, could lead to an incredible opportunity. And that's that's what happened. So uh, in 2012, I um, by then I had met Dennis, uh, my current husband in Huntsville and uh, Leap of Faith. We just both decided to move to D.C. Um, and ended up uh, staying. So here we are. So family is really important to me, and I had to do a balancing act along the way. I had two children, and uh, Dennis has two children as well. And so I was working mom, and before you had, we had the technology to be able to work from home. So um, my kids went to daycare. Yes, I felt guilty about that. Yes, it was a balancing act. Um, all of those, all of those feelings, um, but we made it work out. And looking back, um, you know, I'm I'm really proud of how uh, how they turned out. They both ended up being musicians, so both of them were were good at math and science, but they didn't love it, you know, like me. So 
uh, they they both were inspired by an incredible um, middle and high school band program. And so now they're they're both professional musicians. My son is in Illinois and is a trombone uh, professor at Eastern Illinois University. I just saw him last weekend. And my daughter is a uh, saxophonist, singer, songwriter, artist, manager, you name it. She does it. Uh, in the Denver, Colorado area, and I'm going to see her in a couple of weeks. So um, they live far away, and I don't get to see them enough, but uh, I sure am proud of them. Um, and there's my husband, Dennis. We own a boat, um, and we keep it down um, at the D.C. Uh, waterfront, which is which is great because it's a 15 minute walk to my office from there. And uh, that's that's a much better commute than Ashburn. So we divide our time um, between uh, between the house and the boat. So my lesson in all of this is, you know, there's the kind of the, you've probably heard of the myth of having it all. Can you really have it all? Uh, can you do family? Can you have, you know, a career? Uh, and all of these other things. And I would say, yes, you can have it all. You just can't do it all perfectly all the time. So things ebb and flow. There were times in my life where I had to devote more, more attention to my family. There were times where I just had to, I was going through, you know, I had to gut out something at work, right? And and get through it and, and spend extra time there. So um I feel really passionate about supporting um, any choice because it is a balancing act and that balance is different for everybody. And you've got to find that own balance. So I get a lot of questions, particularly from women who are considering careers in engineering about how do I do this? How can I have a family? And I would say, you know, you've, you just got to find that balance. And I support... Uh, women who want to work, women who want to stay home, you know, men who want to work, stay home. It, it, that choice is a very personal one, and and it's different for everybody. It really does make a difference to have a supportive partner, and, and I sure do, and Dennis. So now, <laughs> um, I do all kinds of stuff. Um, <laughs> you're laughing at the onion picture. Let's talk about the onion picture. So. I did this event um, a few years ago. We rolled out our uh, commercial strategy at an event in New York at NASDAQ, which was the serious picture of me there. And those pictures got out on the web and apparently the onion or anyone can just grab them and use them. So uh, my, I, I, I made the onion not once, but twice and I will say of all the things I've done, my kids got the biggest kick out of that more than anything else. Um, I enjoy engaging with students. There's me um, at an event I did at Georgia Tech and I'm here with you guys today having a ball. Um, I get to go to launches, which I'm gonna do. Um, I get to meet cool people like Alton Brown, who uh, we did a, NASA did a um, crowdsourcing challenge to come up with a deep space food system. And um, Alton was kind enough to do our video promoting the challenge. And I got to meet him and he's, he's a, uh, as you can imagine, uh, very into a space supporter. And then up the, the top right, so during the pandemic, I decided I was gonna learn to make cheese. And uh, I guess it's the chemical engineer in me. My husband and I also make wine at, at home, but I decided I was going to learn to make cheese, and that's me making cheese. And the reason I took this goofy picture in my NASA shirt making cheese is um, this cheese-making site um, asked if they could interview me. <laughs> and And I'm like, you know, normally they're like, people who are owning farms and have their own cows and, you know, and I'm barely dabbling here. And I'm like, oh no, you don't, under, you don't want to interview me. I don't, I'm, I don't make great cheese. And they're like, no, seriously, that's a really cool story. And we'd love to interview you. So that's why I have this picture of me in my NASA shirt making cheese. So, so what, what have I learned and still learning to be honest? Um, 
perseverance and re resilience. The space station went through seven redesigns well, and, all, and was almost canceled except for one vote in Congress one year that saved it. And so through all of that, you know, I learned just to persevere, to roll with that, uh, to be resilient. Even now at NASA headquarters, we have administrations come in and they want to do something differently uh, and have different priorities. And uh, we may have to shift our mission and, and evolve. So you've just got to be kind of flexible and persevere through that. Um, as well as the, just the changes in my life. Um, all of it is experience. I try to stay in, in that, um, that learning mode um, and, you know, take every opportunity and, and really try to, you know, get the experience that I can out of it. Relationships really do matter. And I know you've heard that. It may sound trite, but I've found that over and over in my career that, you know, you've got to nurture those relationships with your coworkers and, and the folks at the, the, the centers. NASA is a really big place and, and your industry partners and your international partners and, and those relationships really do matter. Um, I tr trying to stay in a growth zone. Um, funny story here. My, my daughter, um, gave me a free trial membership to her Peloton app. And I decided I would uh, start to use it to do some strength training at home. And I was doing this workout one day and the, the Peloton coach who calls everybody Peloton um, said, uh, you know, you wanna stay in, in your, you wanna get out of your comfort zone and stay in your growth zone. And I know we were working out at the time, but that really resonated with me, you know, just, as a whole is, you know, I, I love nothing more than I'm a big introvert, honestly. And I would love, I love nothing more than, you know, give me a spreadsheet, give me a problem to work on, leave me alone. Um, and, and I'm happy. Um, but I have learned, you know, getting out there and expanding and it, it's all growth opportunities. And so I try to push myself you know, to get out of that comfort zone and uh, and experience new things and try to do new things. You seldom feel like you're ready, um, but you can step into it and, and stay in that growth zone. And then finally, that you can be yourself. When I first came to uh, NASA headquarters is a different culture than working at a NASA center. Um, and NASA center is focused very, very much more on the hands-on laboratory uh, project work. Uh, NASA headquarters is a whole political environment. And when I first came to NASA headquarters and sat in some of my first meetings, there were a lot of type A people. Um, and there was the right way to say something and, oh no, we can't do that. And we, you know, and I thought I never felt like a bigger fish out of water. And I thought, I'm not, I'm not them. I can't be type A. I can't be, you know, that. Uh, and I thought, you know, I'll never get this. But after watching and learning and then sort of adapting to who I am, um, you know, and I'm still learning it, but I'm much more comfortable. And, um, but I, I'd still true to myself, right? I don't have to. Uh, be someone I'm not. And uh, I think that's, you know, just, uh, I think that's a good lesson for everybody. I've had students come up to me and, um, you know, say, hey, you know, how do you, how do you manage um, being an introvert in this kind of role? And do, you know, can I do something like that? And yes, you absolutely can. Um, and you can be yourself. So still learning lessons, um, even after this, uh, this career. So that's what I have. I think more QR codes for you to look, uh, look up. If you haven't signed up for Spot the Station, um, you can uh, do that. You can enter your phone number, get a text anytime. Space Station is flying over Blacksburg or wherever, wherever your home is. Uh, internship opportunities. 
uh, follow us on social media. And if you want to learn more about the research, um, we have resources for that too. So I'll leave you with that. And then I think we're going to start our Q&A. I'm a little jealous that you got to meet Alton Brown. He inspired me to start using a sous vide. Best way to cook. Um, so our first question from the audience is, the ISS is very much an international collaborative effort. How have these efforts and how how have these efforts and how you approach them been affected by current global events such as the war in Russia and Ukraine? Oh, we start with the heavy question, man. <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, that, that's been a difficult situation, um, unfortunately, that we've had to deal with. Um, our work on the International Space Station is peaceful purposes, and, and that's our focus. And even while uh, this war is going on and, you know, our country is um, you know, sanctioned and done all kinds of actions to try to, to, to support Ukraine, um, our professional relationship with the Russians has continued what it is. So, we, um, our crew, uh, very much is an integrated crew, and we work together every day on the space station uh, in a professional way, and we work professionally with our colleagues. Um, and so we, we carry on. It, we're very much interdependent, the way the space station is designed. Um, no country can operate it by itself. Um, the Russians provide the propulsion for the vehicle. We provide the power. Um, we fly on each other's vehicles. So we're very much in, interdependent and by design. And so, um, uh, but fortunately, we've been able to, to keep the partnership. Our next question is, what were the struggles becoming the first female ISS director at NASA or a woman in engineering more generally? And how did you overcome those struggles? Yeah, so it really just, uh, the culture at NASA really has changed. When I first started, it was very, very male dominated. Um, one of the things that I had to, uh, I, that I got involved in is uh, setting up an on-site daycare center at Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, we had a bunch of young families, they wanted on-site daycare. We had um, two gyms. Um, and a tiny daycare center that was sharing a space with one of the two gyms um, and uh, trying to get uh, the male leadership at Marshall Space Flight Center to agree to give up one of their gyms so that we could expand the daycare center was something I had to do. Um, ultimately, uh, we prevailed. So it has been interesting over the years. Um, I have not tried to get too um, bothered by, you know, or really feel like Oh, I had to prove myself, I would say. Um, but uh, the culture is very much shifted now. And four of our center directors are females. My boss is a female, first in her role as associate administrator, um, and then first in my role. So um, times sure have changed. And I think NASA's one of our core values is diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we're very much um, um, look like that now. Our deputy administrator is a female, and, and the culture is very, very different now. So I feel very supported, um, and by by all of, all the leaders. So our next question um, is on a topic of technical barriers. Um, what is the biggest barrier to space exploration that we'll have to cross in the next few decades, or maybe even in a shorter time horizon? Too? Two questions. say it's a combination of barriers. So there, there are technical barriers. For example, our life support systems need to be more reliable. Have to develop a way to land big things on uh, planetary surfaces. So we, you know, propulsion system that can get us there faster, for example, to go further. Uh, so there are, there are technical things. I honestly think that the bigger barrier is the political will sometimes um, and, and 
getting behind these programs. Um, and it's tough when administrations change and what you were doing now is something else. Um, they want us to do something fast <laughs> within a four year amount of time, right? Uh, which is often hard. So the political will and then getting the budget. NASA um, is part of the sliver of the federal budget that is discretionary spending. And the you know, there isn't that pie is shrinking, you know, as uh, programs like other other big programs take up more of the budget. So um, so th those are some of the barriers. But all in all, I think we're making great progress. And uh, the NASA budget has grown and we've gotten great support. And so as you know, there's support for the Artemis mission and, and we're on our way. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Glad to hear that. And I think we've overcome another technical barrier because we now have two microphones. Um, thank you to our production team. Um, so I guess to kind of build off that question, how do you envision the next generation space station? Specifically, um, what kinds of technologies do you think will be the most vital to ensuring the longevity of the vessel, safety and health of the crew aboard, and the advancement of scientific research in orbit? So I think uh, the next generation space stations are gonna be uh, probably more efficient, mm -hmm. um, probably uh, have, a, be designed to host a variety of activities from government research to tourism, manufacturing, um, and really to um, what needs to happen though is the uh, cost of transportation to the mm -hmm. space stations needs to come down. Mm -hmm. That's really what's going to open up um, access for um, all of these markets, right? So. Um, right now, it's still fairly expensive to launch a person or an experiment to the space station. And, uh, but with reusable technology, starting to see the, uh, those, those costs going down, I think as that te technology progresses, um, that's really going to be a game changer uh, the future space stations. Yeah, definitely. Um, you kind of segued into our next question quite naturally. Um, but another student asked, what are some of the current challenges that the ISS faces? And, you know, with a lot of enthusiastic students in the audience, part of research groups and different things on campus, how can universities and research groups therein contribute towards solving them? Some of the current challenges is we've got more demand than we have resources, um, which is a, a fantastic problem. But we've gotten really innovative in trying to expand our capabilities on the space station. Um, one of the things we're in the middle of doing is augmenting our power systems through new solar arrays that we're actually rolling out on top of our old solar arrays uh, to provide additional power, really cool technology. Uh, so we're using the space station in new and different ways every day, and it's fun to see those innovations. I would say um, some of the really uh, cutting edge stuff that, that needs to happen is, is really translating laboratories on Earth and equipment to do uh, research here on Earth to the space environment and being able to um, iterate on experiments on board. You know, most of the time uh, you launch an experiment, uh, the, conduct uh, the one run, you get your data uh, back down and then whatever you learn, now you've got to launch all over again to do another run. So the ability uh, to uh, change your parameters and conduct more, multiple runs will be a game changer as well. So that requires some innovation in laboratory equipment itself and how experiments are run. Um, and then there's just this whole world of space research that I think is really exciting. Um, I think is ripe for universities uh, really embrace and develop that next generation of space researcher um, you know, who know how to do um, you know, science and space. Yeah, definitely. We have a few teams in the audience tonight even that send things into space, maybe on a yearly basis. And as a computer science major where we can iterate so frequently, that's always been one of the most fascinating parts to me is just you really have to plan because if you make a mistake or you need to do something differently a year out for the lead time. 
Um, I guess kind of moving back to your personal career journey, um, what's a typical day in the life as ISS director? Um, and then at any point in your career, did you have to make a choice between engineering and management roles? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer the second one first. Um, yeah, I did have to have to choose that path. Um, you know, I, I, I talked about how along the way I, I, I evolved into more of a leadership role, but it was all engineering leadership. Um, when I got to headquarters, I was still doing pretty, a pretty technical role. I was um, still kind of leading life support um, planning for the agency, but I got the opportunity to become the deputy director. Um, and, um, and I didn't want to give up my other hat. I didn't want to give up my technical hat. To, to be, and so I, I said, well, don't, don't make me choose. And so I did this to myself, so I said, okay. So I essentially did two jobs for a while because I, I did not want to choose between the duties of the deputy director and that potential career path and what I was doing um, in my technical role. Um, so I did that for a while, about killed myself, and then got the opportunity to um, for the permanent, for the director role. And at that point, had to give up that life support system lead job. And it was like tearing my baby away from me, honestly, it, it, it really was tough. Um, but yeah, I had to make that choice. Um, first question, <laughs> no, sure. I've forgotten. Um, I've the first question was, you know, you kind of hinted at it in your answer, but what's a typical day in the life? Oh, day I in the life, director? yeah. Every day is a little bit different. Um, lots of meetings. Lots of, uh, you can imagine, um, for example, today, okay, let's take today. I don't know if that's a typical day. I drove here, um, but on the way had uh, a number of calls. I had uh, a call with the Office of Science, Technology and Policy because we're working on a strategy document um, for how to sustain as the government uh, ongoing research and development in orbit. Um, I had some, some status calls. Um, uh, I, I have uh, interchanges with my team, um, with our NASA leadership, uh, the administrator, um, and other members of our leadership. Um, I am gonna get up tomorrow and drive home and get on a plane and go down to Florida to get ready for this crew launch. And my duties there, are really to, to do international engagement um, with uh, the partners that are gonna be down for the launch, uh, monitor uh, and prepare for the launch, be aware of the countdown and just any issues that are arising leading up to the launch. And then my, my duty for the launch will be to be uh, in the, uh, the place where the the administrator and other guests are assembled and I'll give the mission briefing uh, before we watch the launch together. So um, all of that's really cool, but every day is a little bit different. You know, some are more mundane with me, some are you know, pretty exciting. I guess maybe a little bit of a follow-up question. You mentioned giving briefings to the NASA administrator. At what point in your career, or maybe never, did those butterflies go away when you're you know, talking to someone bigger? Probably never, but it gets a little bit easier. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you two stories. Um, the, I mentioned having to go uh, to the White House and, and sell extension of space station to 2030. Um, so I prepared this big briefing and there we off we go. It wasn't the actual White House. It was actually the Eisenhower Executive Office building inside the White House property, but Nevertheless, and the meeting was in the vice president's ceremonial office, which is a really intimidating room. And uh, they had set up the projector and, and my boss was right with me. The administrator was there. There were all these heads of other uh, office of management and budget, all these people. In the room. And, and they all looked at me and it was time to get a briefing and yeah. Not gonna lie, that that was a nerve-wracking experience. But kind of once I got going, 
you know, the way I deal with that is just to prepare the heck out of it. I just over prepare almost so that in the moment I can, I can just rely on that preparation. Another thing I had to do was um, I had to be the NASA witness for a congressional hearing. And those are pretty nerve wracking. I had never done one before, but Congress wanted to do a hearing on space station uh, transition and asked me to be the to be the witness. So it's it's a lot of theater, uh, but you have to prepare your testimony, read your testimony, and then anticipate all the questions that they could throw at you. And so um, again, just prepping and prepping helped get me through that, but it, it was a really nerve wracking experience. And I'm glad I did it and they seem pleased. Um, I'd be happy not to do another one, but. Uh, I'm sure that's a common feeling after those hearings. Um, okay, so we have time for a couple more questions. Um, back to the space station for a second. Um, do you see any possibility of repurposing components of the ISS for gateway or other space programs for reusability? And is there any benefit to bringing the ISS back safely to Earth so that NASA can study its structure and the effects of long-term space environment exposure? Yeah, we get this question because everybody's sad about the idea that you know, we're going to have to deorbit the space station after 2030. And we'd love to bring the whole thing home and put it in a museum. But uh, unfortunately, it wasn't built to be taken apart or brought back home. Um, we can bring small items back home and some of that equipment, some of that laboratory equipment I, I was talking about. Um, we'll try to do as much of that as we can, given what our cargo ships can carry. Um, but the big pieces, unfortunately, we're not going to be able uh, to bring back. We did a couple studies where we asked industry, hey, would you want to either take over the space station or um, take parts of the space station? And we honestly did not get any proposals um, to do that. It's pretty complex and it's not all ours. So the US owns some of it and other countries own some of it. And again, it really is difficult to um, take it apart. I, talking earlier, it's like, you know, your house has all the plumbing and all the wiring and all, and, and, and then someone would come along. It's like someone coming along and saying, can, can you take the bathroom out? And can I have that? You know, you can imagine how complicated that would be. It's really, really not feasible. So I guess maybe to close out tonight on a positive note um, with our final question, what has been the most gratifying moment in your work? I think just working on this project for my whole career is, is pretty gratifying, but I'm super excited about all the results that we're getting from the scientific research. And we're working on better ways of sharing that uh, with the general public so that we can get, get the word out better about all those results. But I'm really pumped about accomplishing all the goals. You know, the, the medical research that is going on, I think is, is going to save lives that could not otherwise have been saved and been to the space station. We're, we're able to operate on brain tumors today, previously inoperable, through the technology developed from the for example. So just the amazing amount of results coming out of the research, I think, pretty exciting. I'm proud of that. That's great to hear. Um, so let's give it up again for Director Robin Gatins of the International Space Station. On behalf of the Student Engineers Council at Virginia Tech, I'd like to thank you all for attending our Shoot for the Stars lecture tonight. The first annual lecture will be back next year for our second e-week lecture. And for those of you who have been attending our events throughout the week, um, I guess as a bit of a housekeeping note, if you're here as part of an e-week team and would like to let us know that you're here, if you go to sec.vt.edu slash space, that's sec.vt.edu slash space, you can register that. Um, and we will see many of you tomorrow night at our casino night in the Owens Ballroom at seven o'clock. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>